Hi, this is Tom from Wakefield Biochar. You're listening to Smart Talk. The Mike Novak Show starts in three, two, one. This is a special quarantine edition of Stephen Colbert's Midnight Confessions. Audience, this year on my taxes, I'm claiming my sourdough starter as a dependent. I did not end up using this time to finish reading my novel. And by finish, I mean start. And by novel, I mean Nespresso instruction booklet. So you put the pot in, you push the button. Why, don't, why is there a book? When I Zoom with people, I spend the entire time looking at myself, Zooming with them. If we have to be in isolation, I'm hoping we'll get to find out which celebrities actually have gray hair. My money's on Kermit. You're 65, Kermit. You're not fooling anyone. If I had to join TikTok or die, I'm sure it would be a nice funeral. Forgive me, audience. We forgive you. Thanks. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome at 877-711-5611. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. True currents and thriving seas, wind blowing through breathing trees, strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. This hour is brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. Good planets are in the main. Right. And welcome to the show. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a beautiful, chilly day as we head into summer, meteorological summer. Um, and uh, whoa, okay, <laughs> we're things here. Boy, that was the uh, the sound. That's okay. I can bring that down. Kathleen's uh, busily fixing the the other computer that's here. Uh huh. Couldn't, couldn't You're get- getting sound effects. And the sand, you plug it in, and there go the sound effects. Um, and that's the uh, the beauty and the dismay of doing stuff from home on uh, the Zoom machine. Uh, welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Molecki. Today, trees. Yeah, we have to talk about trees. It, yeah, mm-hmm. let's get let's get a ding in there, and we have uh, one of our very favorite tree guys with us today, Tree Skeetman, uh, which is not his real name. That's his alias. <laughs> Yes, and he is watching us live on Facebook too. And he's even got uh, background <laughs> there uh, that he's going to have, have Critter Carnival, and uh, he brings bugs in. You know, to to use a common phrase, bugs. He brings bugs into the studio, and uh, we revel at how nasty they are and how fun they are. Well, he's not in the studio because we're not in the studio so he's got them all on display on the zoom machine so um we're gonna have bugs crawling across the screen even uh, i hope so oh if he could make that work if you can make a, a bug crawl across the screen that'd be really good <laughs> skeet so to try uh, he, he's i don't know he might have something in store for us uh, and by the way skeet is from uh, our our sponsor bartlett tree experts because every tree every needs, needs a champion, champion. That's right. And um, that's that's hard to do that in sync. On yeah, Zoom. There's no way we can do it in sync. Okay, we need to take a break. We'll be back with Tree Skeetman. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Molecki. We're lurching into summer. We do that to all of our seasons. We just lurk. We will be right back. 
Kaboom! <laughs> Jobs remote, you're broke, you hide it from the plague. It's like you're always stuck in quarantine. And you might be there a day, a week, a month, or even a year, but I'll be there for you. Washing my hands all day. I'll be yeah, there for welcome you. back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Uh, I, I said last week that I might not be playing any more of these, but I found six really good ones so <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, well at least another week of the covid themed musical bumps uh going into our segments that is the friends theme of course a guy named michael rose did that and i think other people have done that as well often when i when i play these songs there's three or four versions of them and i try to pick the best version uh and that was that was pretty well executed mm-hmm. uh welcome to the show we're very happy to have Tree Skeetman, and again, not his real name. Uh, actually, we just call him Skeet. Uh, and Good morning. How are you? We're doing great. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk about trees and tree care and Bartlett tree experts. We're here to help you out. All right. And, uh, and you guys, uh, as folks who listen to our show know, um, even during the pandemic, the tree guys have been out there because storms still happen during a pandemic and trees need care um and um you guys were and are essential services uh tell me a little bit about what's happening you you wrote to me uh, the other day skeet and you told a story of the kinds of things you encounter during the pandemic when you're trying to do tree care thank you mike and peggy yes it's been uh it's it's been exciting it's been different uh Bartlett Tree Experts is an international company throughout the United States, Canada, Ireland, England, and uh, with, with four offices in Chicago. And sometimes there's confusion. Um, it's not a local company from Bartlett. It's a not from Bartlett, Illinois, or even Bartlett, Oklahoma, <laughs> yeah. or Bartlett, Bartlett, Kansas, or wherever. There's there's probably a Bartlett in every state of the union. And we do service Bartlett, Illinois, and there you go Wisconsin and Indiana. So. Uh, well, and, and and Pennsylvania and yeah. Minnesota. So uh, those of us, uh, our listeners who are in those states, um, can also benefit from Bartlett Tree Experts. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. And and we're fortunate the state of Illinois did deem us essential. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's it's nice to have that governor stamp of approval. We are essential. Um, I needed to. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'll, my wife. We all yes. need that. I, 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 I've been waiting for the governor to tell me that I'm essential. Okay. I've been waiting now for three months and nothing, not a, not a word out of the governor's mansion. And, and you would be an arborist too, Mike and, and Peggy. <laughs> so uh, I, I deem you essential and you Thank get you. the official Bartlett seal of approval there. Um, so we are essential uh, and, and it's been really an, an interesting opportunity because we've never gone through this as, as a company, as a society, uh, and the outpouring of love to our team from our clients has, has just been overwhelming. And we really appreciate the clients out there. Um, they feel bottled up and we were really nervous to get started and we would give a wave or a call and boy, it was, it was tough to get them not to be around us and <laughs> and they they wanted to be outside and, and everybody they wanted to wants be to be with the arborists so you yes know. you know there we we were just a, a great excitement to be outside and mm-hmm. and and sometimes an appointment that would normally take 5 10 15 minutes you know you'd look down and boy i'm here for 45 minutes because they just want to absorb that information were and, you uh what, what, what were you doing? Were you standing in the yard and, and talking to them through the windows or something? From Sometimes a... we would do that. Sometimes they'd want to be outside. We both have some masks on and have some social distance. Uh, you know, they might have some kiddos with them and they may be on a playground on one side and they want to be with us on the other side of the yard. Um, some folks would just like us to point and uh, be on the telephone with them. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's up to the client to make the decision of their comfort level 
of where they want to be uh, to have us care for their trees and give us the information that they need. And, and even though states are now opening up slowly and it's going to be fits and starts throughout the country, wherever Bartlett uh, services trees, um, it is, uh, oh boy, and it was one of those moments where the thing just went out of my head. Uh, I think people are going to continue to be careful. So you're still going to encounter some of the same situations that you have in the past three months. Uh, and one of the things you said you needed to work on a tree and you couldn't get your trucks in because nobody's moving their cars. They're parked yes. in the street. I'm waiting. What's going to happen when they do street cleaning here in front of my house? Because uh, they're going to put the signs up, but nobody's going anywhere. So I'm wondering if any of the cars are going to move and they're going to actually be able to clean the streets. You had a similar situation when you were trying to work on a tree. Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of times um, park lots are open. It's, it's this interesting dynamic where some corporate centers we'd work on on the weekends because mm -hmm. people are not at corporate centers. And uh -huh. we work on some residential and condominiums during the weekdays. Yeah. Well, people are home and they're not moving cars. And as part of uh, Bartlett Tree Experts protocol, we have one person per vehicle for our own team. So we're bringing more vehicles on site. We're bringing more support equipment on site than we have in the past. So just for safety protocols of, of the hand washing, the sanitizing, the bottled water, um, we're, we're just bringing more equipment mm -hmm. to sites. So there's a whole safety protocol that goes through in the morning and then on site and then in the afternoons. So it, it's it's a lot more communication and being client aware for the right team for the right site for the right place yeah That's and it. and and then we should mention that bartlett prides itself on safety uh that is key to the operation anywhere uh, absolutely yes. um so uh all right but here we are it's it's summer's going to come yeah. whether we wanted to or not <laughs> Although it's, it doesn't feel like it today, it's. Uh, in fact, I was I was listening, uh, uh, folks listening to us at KOTA, in Rapid City, South Dakota. Uh, I was listening uh, yesterday, and it was 50 degrees, and I'm thinking, yikes. Okay, and then here in Chicago today, it is uh, it is cool. It's uh, it's it's uh, under 60 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what you have up your way. You say it was pretty cold, Peggy. Yeah, let's. Last evening was down around 53 with a northeast breeze off the lake. Now, right now, I've got the window open and getting a pretty chilly breeze still. But... Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, but but that's tree... changing. <laughs> and and a tree doesn't care if it's 50, but a tree does care if it's 28 degrees for more than four hours, as Rick DeMaio, our meteorologist, uh, defines a hard freeze. Uh, and we had that about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I guess now. No, Mother's Day. Yeah, Mother's Day. It was freezing in many parts of the Midwest, and some trees took a hit, didn't they, Skeet? Absolutely. Oh, look at uh -huh. that, and he switched the photo on cue. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> Those look of you watching, watching on Facebook, boy, yeah, would, you, would you like to direct my, my shows here and do the, uh, the video? Right. That's what happens when you get to work at 7 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> 9 o'clock go. You, you try to prep the best you can. Uh -huh. uh, right behind me is a ginkgo tree. And I can move out of the way a little bit and have some fun with this. And you're right. Uh, the ginkgo trees uh, took a beating in that frost. You can see the brown leaves were the first set of leaves that came out. Uh -huh. And that frost and snow froze that tender new tissue. Mm -hmm. And you can see the green where the new or second set of leaves are starting to emerge from the ginkgo. So bad news is it got hit with the weather. Good news is it is bouncing back. Um, however, that tree used a lot of reserves to come back a second time. Um, those stored carbohydrates, sugars into the root system produced a first set of leaves. Now we got to get a second set of leaves out. And uh, yikes, you know, we're, we're, we might see some tip dieback in these. We might see some secondary insect or disease. We're certainly going to recommend just the basics of tree care, fertilize, mulch. Let's keep the lawnmower weed whackers away, large mulch rings, um, monitor in the summer for moisture, 
and it's been a rainy, wet May, and and we're just finishing May, and mm -hmm. you know Rick DeMaio can tell you your best, um, but I think it's about the third or fourth wettest May we've ever had. No, it's number one. Number, number one. one. Numero uno. Okay. Number one. Had, Thank you, Mike. More rain in the Chicago area, and and yeah. Michigan, of course, had dams breaking. We talked about that last week, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was looking at a map of the general Midwest area, with the exception of Minnesota, which is actually a little drier than usual. States like Wisconsin, Illinois, Missouri, uh, Iowa, uh, yes, uh, parts of Iowa, Ohio, Indiana, very wet, lots of moisture. So the, all of those folks are dealing with some of the same things now, but that came after the freeze. Was that a good thing, do you think, for the ginkgo trying to leaf out again that it was able to get some extra moisture? The, the, the little moisture, yes. Uh, when we have complete saturation, no. Okay. Uh, we, we Trees don't drown so much as they suffocate. The water pushes the oxygen out. The root system needs to breathe, and the trees then suffocate. Mm -hmm. we, we've seen that in different trees and so no that much that much rain we're going to see issues problems frustrations mm -hmm. um, think of your house plant when it gets over watered you stick your finger in a pot and it's wet and it looks droopy like geez why is it droopy well because it's got to drain and breathe and the root systems need that oxygen exchange underground yeah and then skeet, I would imagine if the soil around the tree gets more compacted with activity out in the yard, something driving over it, people, kids going back and forth a lot, that's going to take more oxygen out as well, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And then you, you put into our urban soils mm -hmm. and then, it, you know, is, is it, does it have a, a root system to support the tree? And in an urban environment between sidewalk, blacktop, wrong tree, wrong spot, uh, poor soil, I mean, these are all just compounding factors that then stress weaken, opens up the tree to secondary disease and problems. And, and that's where really having a green team, certified arborist, the homeowner looking for signs, symptoms, working together, putting together a plan for the trees, that's where we can excel. Uh, you know, and, and you bring that up, and I will say to folks listening, not everybody who's uh, within the shouting distance of our signal uh, can take advantage of Bartlett services. If, if you are in their territory, I say go to Bartlett.com. However, I always tell people, in any case, please consult an arborist, even if Bartlett is not in your area. Find another good tree care company and get an arborist out there and get an expert opinion. Don't guess with um, a resource uh, uh, like a tree in your yard, which adds value to your property. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it sounds like um, the ginkgos then took uh, a double hit. It was a, it was a double whammy. So they got the freeze. And as they're trying to push out new leaves, which is expending a lot of energy in that tree, uh, it's getting hit by rains. And if these uh, roots are soaked they're having a hard time bringing in oxygen so i wouldn't be surprised if we see some decline in some trees this year is that right skate absolutely and you know what mike i would just add to your thoughts there um it's not so much an arborist as it is a certified arborist and you can check the credentials to the international society of arboriculture so certified arborist um, then there's accreditation bartlett tree experts is accredited through tree care industry association so um, right now you and peggy can put out a business card and go knock on doors and say you're an arborist <laughs> uh, and i belong and, and, be, and, and, and you'd be correct however you you could not say legally yet you're a certified arborist and and with you know accreditation what? I, I always assume you're certified. I'm glad you brought that up, but yes, check the accreditation. Okay, we need to take a short break. We're gonna talk more about trees with Skeet. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and we'll be right back. One, two, three, four. Welcome back, 
the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. That is uh, the Phoenix Chamber Choir. The Phoenix Chamber Choir got together on Zoom. You know, the multi-screen with like 50 mm -hmm. people on it uh, and all singing along uh, with this arrangement of uh, For the Longest Time. So um, I found that one. And I and you're going to like the next one, too. The next one is uh, that we do mm -hmm. uh, going back from the next break is pretty good. Uh, welcome back to the show. We have uh, Mr. Skeet. Uh, there and he's doing show and tell no uh, critter carnival in the studio but there are critters and diseases that we're talking about and we should mention a couple of things we've had uh, some comments on Facebook thank you for uh, everybody watching there and you can do that by going to the Mike Novak show on Facebook Sunday mornings from 9 to 11 central time uh, and you can watch all two hours some of you listening around the country get one hour or and uh, some get both. And uh, you can you can watch us here on camera. And uh, you might see I've got my Pluto parka on today. Uh, Pluto, never forget, 1930, 2006. No matter what Neil deGrasse Tyson thinks, Pluto is a planet. No matter what Scott Jameson thinks, Pluto is a planet. <laughs> you cannot take, uh -oh. cannot take away my youth, okay? You cannot just... <laughs> snatch my youth okay just like that all right just letting you know you know uh and uh thanks for everybody who's who's watching us so skeet you've got show and tell there behind you you're gonna have to do yes. it for, do it for radio though too because okay. people not watching what have you got all right well it is viburnum leaf beetle season viburnum leaf beetle uh, arrived in chicagoland oh five six seven years ago um, and it attacks viburnum shrubs. The frustration with this um, beetle, viburnum leaf beetle, is the larvae eat on the bottom side of the leaves. So you can look at your shrubs and you're not gonna see what's over my head here, or, which is the little larvae <laughs> that are eating the leaves bottom up. Uh, That's, and and so, you've, got, you've got the bottom of the leaf showing there, right? I've got the bottom of the leaf showing, yes. And this is one nasty little critter because it will skeletonize and um, defoliate the I, viburnums. Look at that. That's the first stage, which is now. So you can go out and look at your leaves, and this is what you'll see as a skeletonized leaf. Turn it over, you'll see the larvae. Mm -hmm. The larvae then drop down, they turn into, they molt and go into a beetle form. They crawl back up and they eat again wow. as if they didn't do enough damage the first go around. And they Yikes. come back and eat again in, in uh, June, July. Who, who's, who gave them they, permission on to the have same, Say that, Peggy? On the same, the same shrub they're going to go back or they're going to go to a different one? They're going to go to the same shrub. Same they one. Just love the viburnums. Well, no, but so, I mean, to, to a different viburnum than the one they just that they. No, the same one because it no, just the same one. leaves out, and now they can eat it again. Yeah. So, but, but they don't travel. They they stay in a very small area. Correct. Yes, and they're host specific to viburnum, hence viburnum leaf beetle. Uh, then. Yes, Mike. I just gonna say this is something you say it's here, but it's in other parts of the country too. And this is a, a relative, relatively new problem, isn't it? New being in the last three to five years. Yes. That's yes. relatively new. I mean, in the scheme of things, but okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you point out yes. Go no, no, you go ahead. Ski. They, Sorry. Slid, they slid in, they lay eggs and that's where they're going to spend from about August to next May. So one alternative is to reduce them by about a foot to two foot. And if you reduce them or prune them back in the middle of winter, you're taking those egg sources away from the plant. And so come spring, it's gonna leaf out and it's not gonna have the eggs that were laid in the summer for the next season. So if we're looking for an alternative to uh, spraying the plants um, and doing other applications, a dormant season pruning is a fantastic way to reduce the populations of this pest. Are they on the edges 
uh, at the tips of the branches? Is that where you're towards the top eight to 12 inches of the plants? Okay. But well, you might have to do a significant pruning if you had a serious problem, uh, it seems to me. Correct. And that would be perfect for the dormant season where that stored energy is into the root system. And then mm -hmm. they're going to come back as opposed to just a summer shearing, 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 mm -hmm. stressing the plant, get a little aggressive in the wintertime would be an alternative. You uh, bring something up, though, when you were showing the very first slide, and it was the, the underside of the leaf. And this is a, a rule of thumb for any plant and anybody it, uh, looking in their garden and trying to figure out what's wrong with a plant. Uh, too many people never lift up the leaf and look uh, at the underside. They're looking everything from the top and they go, well, I don't see anything. And then they move on. A lot of what's going on is going to be on the underside of a leaf, isn't it, Ski? Correct. And, and this is the perfect example of knowing the, the scouting procedures, knowing the insect, the bug, the pest at the right time of the year on the plant and what to look for. So this is very host specific as opposed to organizations that may do a coverall or spray all trees and shrubs in spring. Um, we're going to be very specific in our teams and our technicians that are out in the field have weekly meetings to look for certain disease, bugs, insects, disease on certain plants, certain times of the year. So scouting is critical for this. And that's another point that uh, people who are checking their plants need to understand is that insects are, you have to pay attention to the life cycle of an insect to know when it's going to do damage and when it's not going to do damage. And, and, and when you can uh, treat it. Right, exactly. And a, a really good example of that is not a tree, but the squash vine borer. Uh, and uh, the, some of the best advice about planting squash in your backyard that I've ever heard is from my friend Dan Costa at Vern Goer's Greenhouse. And he's, his, his, his rule of thumb is 4th of July. Because by the time you get to the 4th of July, that the insect has passed that part of its life cycle. So it, it's not going to invade your vine uh, because it's no longer a, in the larval stage. It's moved on. And so you're not going to have to deal with that. If you're planting them early, yeah, you might get attacked by the, the squash vine borer. Um, and, and the same thing holds for, for trees, doesn't it, Ski? Absolutely. Um, there, there's a great book called Coincide where... We can look at degree days. We can look at uh, when different plants are blooming and different characteristics of different plants to know the timing, um, which is critical to our business. And when you have the rainiest May, um, it creates some excitement of trying to get the right application down at the right time of the year. Yes. Yeah. And that applies to your area, of course, too. And you mentioned degree days. And there's another thing that folks need to know is that a plant doesn't care what the date is on the calendar it's just paying attention to the temperature and the light and uh that's why the morton arboretum has this wonderful plant degree days and it shows where we are during the year and it adds them up and you get so you get to the point where uh the insects are responding to cumulative temperatures during the year and that's what scientists and arborists pay attention to right ski absolutely that that's critical. We are so fortunate to have the Martin Arboretum so close. Um, Bartlett Tree Experts is a sponsoring uh, member of the plant clinic. We do a lot of training and help the plant clinic. Um, it is a tremendous resource. And if I remember, they're looking to open um, this week. And so kudos to the Arboretum to start opening up and uh, mm -hmm. join in as a member. I believe it's gonna be members only that gets access for the for the arboretum for for I believe the month of June, so and uh, and that's uh, I believe happening uh, all over the country. We just got a notice from the Chicago Botanic Garden as well. They're slowly opening up, and they're going to the, let... the perimeter will be open. Yeah, yeah, Botanic Gardens. Yeah. So going back to the to the viburnum, um, what can be done now? Obviously, well, the, uh, if it wasn't pruned in the winter time. Peggy, we can't ask that question because uh, we got 20 seconds to the break. 
Uh, so hold that thought, Skeet. What can you do with your viburnum? Who's at risk uh, for the viburnum beetle? And uh, we'll continue our conversation with Skeet from Bartlett Tree Experts when we return. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Super. In the town of Wuhan, some germs from an animal made a big lep and infected a few. Nobody thought it would be a pandemic, and now the whole world's in a hullabaloo. It didn't take long for the germs to go global in planes and trains and cruises by sea. Now locked in our homes and trying to stay sober, we can't even watch the live sports on TV. Six long months in isolation, six long months doing nothing at all. Six long months in isolation, this lockdown is driving me up the wall. I tried to go out, got sent <laughs> back in again. I Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. And uh, that's, uh, I found that also uh, while I was cruising the used tubes. And uh, that's uh, the Irish COVID-19 song by Lao Wai. And that's spelled L-A-O. And I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right. L-A-O-W-A-I. Interesting. And uh, I have to had to fade out there because he gets a... Uh, um, he, he starts using bad words in there. but A, a, a wee bit blue? Uh, a little bit, yes. <laughs> As I've been I've been accused of, of performing blue uh, at the, the garden <laughs> garden docks, and I'm not really. Believe me, I don't. I just don't get it. Uh, we've got Skeet on the show from Bartlett Tree Experts. Go to Bartlett.com. We're talking about um, a wet spring, um, a cold spring, a disease-ridden spring. We were talking about insects, viburnum leaf beetle, and just before we broke, uh, Peggy asked uh, how you treat that. What uh, what should you do, and how would you respond to that, Skeet? Excellent. Thank you, Peggy. A couple options. Um, this time of the year, there could be a foliar application of a very mild insecticide um, onto the leaves. The fun part about this is spray bottom up because the larvae is out oh. the bottom. So wow. you, you may look a little silly out there, though it's effective and you don't need a lot of high pressure and they're small. So, you know, a homeowner could probably take care of this themselves. Um, there's also a fall uh, application where we can put a systemic into the ground, the tree of the tree, the plant, mm-hmm. the viburnum is gonna absorb that and come spring, um, that would knock them back heavy also, so. Uh, we get very, very, very good success. The challenge is to identify it at the right time of the year. Um, and again, that's where scouting is critical for this insect. Yeah. This is why you pay attention to your plants if you want them to survive. Uh, all right, let's go on to another wet weather problem for those of you experiencing wet weather in the country, and it's a lot of you. Um, Anthracnose, which has a lovely name. Uh, we have to- scary. <laughs> and Thracnose. Um yes. And uh, it is, as I wrote on my blog, and by the way, you can go to MikeNovak.net and find the blog and the information uh, that we're talking about today. Uh, I wrote that it's often uh, less scary than it seems, that it's more cosmetic in nature. Not always, but... I agree. This is a, an aesthetic issue. Um, behind me uh, are silver maple trees. It is not very common to see silver maple trees with anthracnose. And Mm -hmm. um, this is silver maples with anthracnose. And I try to take a a picture and it's just not coming through well with the zoom that the first set of leaves are the leaves that are on the tree the longest. And so they're infected the new set of leaves that are coming out are not as infected. And anthracnose very simply is a leaf fungus. So what's a leaf fungus promoted by favorable environment, cool, wet weather? Boy, boy, we had cool, wet weather. So we're gonna see anthracnose, which is cupped, curled leaves, brown, black margins, Um, The leaves may fall off like ash trees. Ash trees are dropping. Some varieties of ash trees are dropping leaves like crazy. Mm. I can easily see clients a little uh, freaked out and nervous saying, boy, you know, I've made it through emerald ash borer and now what's going on? Um, So we're talking about oaks, ash, um, aspen trees. 
uh, elms, uh, sycamore for sure. Sycamores, you know, you sick some sycamores don't even look like they've leafed out and they look dead, and they're not dead. They've got a leaf <laughs> yeah. fungus called and a branch fungus on the sycamores called anthracnose. Yes. So, but it's uh, not I've harming got... the actual plant. I'm sorry. Correct. Um, on a sycamore tree, um, again, you know, we're talking about in two sets of leaves. That's something where we would recommend treatments because it's going to put the tree into a decline. It's going to put the tree into a stress mode where we don't want secondary issues to come into it. Um, however, most of the oaks, maples, ash um, are going to bounce back from this if, if they're in good care before this issue. Uh, you know, I have, we're into the second or third year of this, so now we're starting to see some decline that we normally would not see. Yes. Uh, yeah, what you mean by that, the second or third year of this, we've had three years in a row in this area with record rainfalls. And each May, we have broken the previous year's record. So those same trees that suffer from anthracnose have been hit three years in a row and that's what you're talking about and it's cumulative and the thing about trees is they're often so large you might not recognize that it's in decline for a number of years i mean i i remember from my master gardener course uh jim schuster who uh uh you know jim schuster i think uh, or do you skeet absolutely uh, 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 okay. Anyway, he used, okay. He, he used to say, talk about trees and he'd show a photo and he said, that's a tree that's dead and doesn't know it yet. Um, and that sometimes happens uh, mm. with, with trees. So, uh, but as, as you say, the yeah. anthracnose uh, generally is not a problem, but if you hit same tree year after year, now you might have a problem. The, those reserves, uh, those built up reserves frozen. are slowly yeah, everybody... being drained. Think of that as a, as a, think of a tree and, and those batteries yeah, or those Skeet's reserves are being there. used and used and used. And so we just need to, uh, again, inspect, take a look at, show the homeowner client what the concern is and, and start the prescription before that death spiral is out of control and we can't turn a death spiral around. That's again, why okay, an I, inspection, taking a tree walk. Yeah, exactly. Take a look. Uh, and if you're not sure what to look for, this is another good reason you call a certified arborist to your Ooh, yard. Ding. <laughs> There's your ding. Uh, and you get them to come out if you don't know what to look for and you are you have this kind of concern bring them out and then they will do that all right we've got just 30 seconds so uh give me uh, 20 seconds worth of advice there skeet first off thank you thank you to bartlett tree experts certified arborist accreditation you know these are large living assets and they need to be cared for and as you said, just if they're important to you, bring out the certified arborists, give us a call. Let's take a look together and then create a plan for the health and maintenance of your trees before that spiral comes in where we can't turn them around. All right. That's a perfect way to end it. Skeet, thank you so much. For those of you uh, who are on the network, go green or go home. Show with Peggy Malecki. This hour is brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. And welcome to the second hour of the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. And uh, I realize I'm looking at my image here on uh, Facebook, and uh, the, the, the skylight is just blasting the bookcase behind yeah. me. I need to put an indoor umbrella here. I need, I, I need a tech crew just to hold an umbrella here during the show so that I, I can actually be seen. To train, train your cat to do that. 
Um, my cat was all over the table earlier, and, and I almost didn't get her off in time for the show. <laughs> Uh, oh, and I want to play one thing I've been 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 meaning to play. Everything's so green. Okay, everything's so green. I don't know if you heard that. Um, mm-hmm. Everything's so green. That's from our buddy Casey Tomato. Oh, that's okay. Casey. Casey Tomato sent that. Yeah, oh. from, from Kansas. Hey, Casey. And uh, I'm growing some of his tomatoes in our backyard, mm-hmm. even as we speak. Uh, you have a real quick announcement before we move yeah. on. Yeah. Coming up today on WCGO and the Smart Talk Network, this week on Gabby Road with Hannah, Fred, and Justin, Saturday Night Live's former head writer T. Sean Shannon is going to be on to talk about the show and share his memories about his friend Fred Willard and Sam Toya, the CEO CEO of the Illinois Restaurant Association, is going to be on talking with them about updating the restaurants that are opening and the state of the industry in general. That's from 11 to one today Um, coming up when playtime with Bill Turk and Harry Kendall rock drumming legend, Carmen, a piece talks about the late, great Ronnie James (laughs) Dio. I don't know him and Led Zeppelin drummer, John Bonham. He's going to be talking about as well. And um, there's a few other people they have coming on and the Elizabeth Alfano show, which is on at three o'clock central time has internationally renowned chef Matthew Kenny, who's got over 40 plant-based restaurants around the globe, including Chicago's Althea restaurant. He's going to talk about his new culinary school, the Food Future Institute. So that is Gabby Road with Fred and Hannah, the Bill Turk and uh, Playtime with Bill Turk and Carrie Kendall, and the Elizabeth Alfano Show, all starting at 11 o'clock right here. And speaking of Bill Turk, uh, those of you who are watching on Facebook heard the concert that was VR Sarti. Uh, who is who Bill Turk introduced me to him, and we might steal one of his songs for uh, for our show intro cool. at, at some point. I, um, and uh, we try to play a little extra music for you if you're watching on the Facebook and uh, YouTube stream. Uh, welcome to the Keep Eating Healthy campaign on the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Molecki. Egg alert! Egg alert! Egg alert! Egg alert! Egg, egg alert! In in my neighborhood, the chickens don't know that Logan Square Farmer's Market isn't open yet, so Cedar Valley Sustainable Farm CSA has a lot of eggs. Today, they're doing pop-up egg sales in Logan Square and Ravenswood. I think I'm going to have to get involved in that. You can go to cedarvalleysustainable.com slash egg hyphen pop hyphen up. Just go to cedarvalleysustainable.com slash egg pop up and don't forget that you can order sustainable meat from cedar valley sustainable farm csa but if you're looking for homegrown organic seasonings backyard patch herbs is where you want to shop online they grow harvest dry and blend their own herbs and now that grilling season is here check out the more than 35 varieties of hand blended herb mixes from dill dip to salt-free ranch salad dressing to marinara and salsa, as well as meat rubs, marinades, and cheese spreads. They have what you need to spice up your meals. And don't forget, use the code MIKE10 and get 10% discount. The folks at Prairie, Prairie Fruits Farm and Creamery are featuring fresh chev, plain herb de Provence, cracked peppercorn, or a seasonal flavor, pickled rampant onion, and they have rhubarb compote this week. Ooh. So... Mix in and enjoy uh, any way you want. Click on the Keep Eating Healthy logo at MikeNovak.net. Help us support these great farms while they support us. Go to MikeNovak.net for more details. When we come back, we're going to talk about making clothing out of milk. Yes, it's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. I don't like your COVID games. Don't like six feet of space you keep my friends away isn't cool no i don't like you i don't like corona welcome back now. to the mike Novak show you with peggy malecki and that's uh, an, another chris mann is making a new career out of uh, doing COVID songs uh that's a, a taylor swift parody and um, there, there were several. There are several Taylor Swift parodies <laughs> out there during the uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, I received a very interesting uh, invitation uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, from somebody on LinkedIn, and uh, his name is Robert Luo, and he said, "I want I want to talk to you about what we're doing with food waste." 
uh, in particular, milk uh, and wasted milk and uh, how his company is turning it into clothing. That is to say, milk teas, as in T-shirts, but also other kinds of clothing. And I thought, oh, wait a second. This is pretty, pretty amazing, given that we waste 40% of our food. Um, you might remember that we had Gary Oppenheimer on the show from ampleharvest.org just a few weeks ago. Uh, according to the USDA, he said 40% of our food worth uh, food worth an estimated $161 billion was never harvested, lost in processing, thrown away in restaurants and homes, or ended up rotting in America's landfills. Um, and it's just uh, a crime that this is happening. So anybody who's who's working hard to to change that equation is welcome on this show. And so we, we bring in Robert Luo, who's the founder and CEO of Me. Tero, M-I-T-E-R-R-O, and you can find the link at my website, MikeNovak.net. Uh, Robert, good morning. Good morning, Mike and Biggie. Good morning. Uh, you've told the story a lot, and 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 you folks should know, <laughs> Robert's 25. He's already sold one business worth three hundred thousand dollars. This is his third business, and now he's out to change the world. Uh, and I, I have a feeling you will. And when you become a billionaire before 30, the age of 30, let me know, okay? Uh, Absolutely, I'll let you know. You're the first one to know. Okay, the very first one. When when the, the account goes over a billion, just give me a holler, all right? Um, and you've told this story, but you've only been doing this. The company's not even two years old, is it? We started in 2018, but we only launched our product in mid of 2019. So you're so basically the product itself is only a year old. So here you are, and you're 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 taking milk, and as you point out, spoiled and unused around the planet each year. It's about 128 million tons of milk that have been wasted every year. 128 million tons of, uh, and as you say, dairy products. Is it just milk, or is it other dairy products as well? It's of their products. In fact, if we're to count, let's say, yogurt, cheese, whey, it's even more than that. Wow. It's just uh, amazing. So how is it you got this idea? Yeah, it all began when I visited my uncle's dairy farm in China in 2018. I went there and I was shocked to see buckets and buckets of spoiled milk. And as you know, spoiled milk smells really bad. <laughs> he was really frustrated because of the smell and also those were money to him. So he asked me to help him find a solution. If we can find a solution to figure out a way to distribute or to sell these spoil milk in a different solution. So that's how everything came about. Uh, and of course it came about because you are already uh, in the United States and studying at the University of Southern California. Um, what was your major over there? I was in business administration. All right, so you're a business guy uh, you see a problem that you think you can solve, but you need the technology behind it. How did you find the technology? Yeah, and that goes back to uh, a friend that I know. His name is called Daniel, who's the, now the CTO of the company. He and I are childhood friends. We have known each other forever. Mm -hmm. uh, I know he has a material science and chemistry background. So when I came back to the States, he was the first person that I spoke with about this issue. I asked Daniel, is it possible that we find a solution to turn all these milk waste? that could have gone to landfill or burn from methane into something that's useful, perhaps something that people can wear so they will understand our mission and the importance of reducing food waste on a daily basis. And we did a lot of research on Google initially. I even spoke with my professor at USC who thought I was crazy. How do you, what, how, why would you even turn split <laughs> milk into something else? Just dump it. But I thought yeah. this must be better use of those food waste. So then we started to do the research and we found out that the milk polymer inside of these spoiled milk can also be used to create something that's strong and valuable for fiber. You know, and that shows uh, really great resourcefulness on your part because I would have agreed with your professor. Well, I'm, I mean, I don't want the milk to just get dumped. That's crazy. Uh, the fact that we we do that is, uh, as I said, it's a crime, and, and we need to figure out how not to do that. Yeah. In fact, 
I mean, I, I want your, your company to succeed, but I would rather we're not dumping 185 million tons of dairy products around the globe each year. Um, and, uh, but you were able to take this and run with it. Uh, is, can you briefly explain the process? Because it goes, it takes how long t- uh, to go from a gla- glass of, and, and on the site there, it says um, a glass of milk will produce four t-shirts, but of course, or five t-shirts, but it's not all the milk uh, 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 fiber, is it? You, you add something else to it. Right. So right now with the shirt that you see on our website, in fact, I'm wearing it right now, we have a blend of milk fiber with Model just to decrease the price. Yeah. But like the sensation, the comfortness is really outstanding. And that's why a lot of our customers came back and told us they will wear our t-shirt, not just for outdoor, but as their sleepwear. Yeah. So that makes it a, a semi-synthetic product with the Model, which Modell is, uh, is also which is plant-based. Yes, plant-based. It's made from beech wood. Yeah. which is uh, similar to cotton, but with more sustainable manufacturing. And that's p- our part of what you talk about as well, is that cotton is, is support, you know, that's the gold standard, uh, but it uses a lot of water. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of chemical use in, in farming it. it does degrade the soil. You're saying you can uh, uh, avoid a lot of that. Is that correct? Correct. In fact, I can show you the fiber right here. This is the fiber that we created. It's ultra soft. And we also use 60% less water compared to organic cotton. So not only are we saving water, electricity, but we're avoiding all this pesticides that's involved in growing the cotton. All right, so you, you get this going and you decide you're gonna do this and you had a Kickstarter. And from what I understand, you were looking for what, $3,000 or something? So our initial goal was about $5,000 and we were okay, fully funded within two hours. Yeah, <laughs> within two hours and, and, and it just, just go, went from there. Uh, which led me, you, we talked, we chatted uh, earlier this week, how Kickstarter, because there's a lot involved in this, how, how do you get the funding for this? Yeah, so initially, we, the, the founders put in the money for the business to run. And we, we thought, if for us to get to the market, we have a bigger audience to support. So that's why we launched Kickstarter. And to validate the market, then we didn't expect to have so much support. Yeah, and now it's become global your support. It's not just in the U.S. Correct. We, in fact, we have been selling to 40 countries in the world. We launched a product in Japan last month, and we will launch it in China next month. And you were telling us you're getting some of the companies on board who are even buying your shirts for private labeling. Correct. So in fact, we have partnered with Danone, which is the parent mm-hmm. company of Silicon Horizon, to produce their Dairy Forum 2020 apparels. Also, Nike has purchased our product at Fiber to run more testing. And we have also gotten interest from HM, Rockler, and these big brands yeah. as they are moving towards sustainability and innovation in their supply chain. That is something that uh, brings to mind uh, some of the problems with fast fashion. Fast fashion is something that uh, is of, of concern to uh, environmentalists. Um, how are you addressing that issue since you're working with people like Nike and H&M? Um, what are you doing to make sure that, uh, that uh, you're still environmentally sound? Yes, we understand that for fashion to make a change, we have to look into supply chain. That's where most of the pollution happens. It's more on the up end, how they grow the raw material, how they blend, how they dye the colors into fabric. So what we want to do is providing our fiber license our technology to these big corporations so they can make a change fundamentally. Uh, so you're working from the inside. Okay, that's very interesting. <laughs> it's not a, a top-down thing. You're saying, okay, I'm your client here. Um, we hope you change your culture. And we should note, and I put a, uh, a link to an article uh, about H&M, which has gotten better in terms of its transparency. It's, it's now leading the world in, in that kind of uh, responsiveness. Um, you've also partnered with Dairy Farmers of America. So you started with Chinese milk, but now you're getting milk from America as well, right? Correct. We started with the milk from my uncle's dairy farm. In fact, the, the shirt I'm wearing actually came from his farm, ah. just to help him out. And now we are we have been accepted into Dairy Farmers America's accelerator, and they're the biggest raw milk supplier in the world. So we look forward to help 
them and also the struggling dairy farmers who are dumping milk every single day during this pandemic mm -hmm. to find a solution and provide a new way uh, of stream of income from these farmers. Yeah. What about plant-based? Are you looking into um, using soy or other plant-based milks? Absolutely. Absolutely. Dairy is the beginning. Once we understand the casein protein polymer inside of dairy products, mm -hmm. we can look into vegan product. In fact, we are testing with vegan product right now. The first type is soy, the soy milk. And uh, this is not the only product you make. Uh, you have worked with plastics and cork uh, to put together bags. Tell us about that. Yes. So when I was um, in USC, I, I actually traveled frequently to China. But whenever I travel, there's isn't a good bag I can carry on. So I thought if we can create a bag that's made from natural material, also perhaps using recycled plastic, that would be wonderful. So we found out that cork is the best replacement for leather. Hmm. So we use cork and create it with recycled ocean plastic for our travel bag. Uh, and the other thing that I'm very interested in and, and pleased to see you're doing is you're working with Operation Food Search to donate 20 meals to a child in need for every purchase. In addition, you're partnering with Eden Reforestation Project to plant, did you say 15 trees for every shirt sold? Correct, correct. Social uh, is very important to us. Yeah, go, go ahead. Explain uh, the, the, the partnership with those organizations. Yes, we are very excited to support Eden Reforestation projects in their way to rebuild our forests as it's been cutting down all around the world. At the same time, we understand in this critical crisis, people are going hungry. They're not getting food they need, especially hungry children. So we are donating 20 meals for every product we sell on our website. In fact, we're giving also giving 25% discounts on top of all these donations that we make. And by the way, let's let people know that again, it's Mi Tero, M-I-T-E-R-R-O, which Spanish, Portuguese, or my my earth, basically, is, doesn't it? Correct. It's a combination of both means my earth. Yeah. Um, what's next for you guys uh, once you get this up and rolling? We're very excited to launch our partnership with these big brands. At the same time, we want to continue developing and see what other type of food is can we re-engineer and bring to a new life? In fact, we are just working on a new technology that can turn whey, which is the byproduct of yogurt, cheese, and ice cream production into food packaging film to replace plastic packaging. And because of this innovative technology, we are competing for the livability challenge in Singapore for $1 million prime price. Wow. wow. When, when do you find out about that? In July. Keep us yeah. posted. And I, and I understand you're going to be on Shark Tank as well. Uh, I can say it, but we will be on Shark Tank. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so, I, ah, okay. <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah. You know what? Uh, Robert, <laughs> Robert is never going to be on Shark Tank. Just to let you know. Oh, dear. Okay. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much, Robert. Uh, congratulations. Please keep in touch with us. I think folks should go to my website and, and find the link. And um, uh, and get some of their products. Uh, and, and try out a T-shirt. It's a very soft fiber. And best of success to you, Robert. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Peggy, for having me today. All right, uh, we have bonus to Mayo on the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki today. Stick around for that. We'll be right back. Waking up is hard to do. Today has run on, away from me. I'm in bed, it seems perpetually. Got no time for nothing new. Cause waking up is hard to do. Remember waking at first light. Going to work, then coming home at night. Now I'm stuck here, routines are through, and waking up is hard to do. They All right, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. That's a woman named Shirley Sturban, and she voiced all of that herself. Uh, again, just multi-tracking on the Zoom machine. And look who has come to join us. She decided she was going to try to get my coffee. It's Lagata, the cat. Uh, those hey. are 
watching on Facebook. Now, Gata, do you want to purr into the microphone here? Hold on. No. I can. No, I can, Okay, I can hear it. I, <laughs> nobody else can. But she's she's purring up a storm here. Okay. Aww. Say hi, and now say goodbye because I. Bye, Gata. I got to do a radio show here. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, we get bonus DeMaio today on the show. Meteorologist Rick DeMaio, who is on the phone. Rick, are you with us? Yeah, I'm with you guys. Did uh, Neil Sedaka approve that, that rendition, by the way? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see if um, Mr. Zuckerberg approved it, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. I'll do this uh, to keep the, the shadow there, there the, the glare. Uh, no, we get we get no permissions from anybody, basically, and then sometimes Facebook. Yeah, I, I, had, I had a feeling. I don't know if you would. I don't know what you would think about that. <laughs> and Facebook and uh, YouTube smack us down from time to time. We just kind of go, oh well, that's that's life in the twenty first yeah. century. Yeah, we we just had something cleared from two years ago. I was like, wow, well, okay. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks for getting back to us on that. Okay, uh, Rick, uh, you just sent us some amazing yeah. photographs. Yeah, isn't that something? I, I actually I came across those when I was um, going through some of my uh, old emails from like 2012, and I'm like, holy smoke, because I know those don't exist anymore on my phone because the phone that I had them on um, no longer exists, right? And I happened to download them, and that's when I lived on Chase. And Mike, you're at that apartment. Um, yeah, I've been there. What was amazing about that, yeah, what was amazing about those photos and you can post them if you want um was that's when the lake was at one of its all-time record lows mm -hmm. due to the fact that we had about a year and a half of dry weather and a really really hot summer in 2012 so that was massive amounts of evaporation and i heard peg you know during the break saying wow there's a walking beach but what was also amazing about that is there were several coyotes um, and I think red foxes that were using that walking beach to go all the way from the cemetery right there at the uh, boundary of Chicago and Evanston, where a lot of them live, and mm -hmm. walking along those beaches all the way down to, I think, um, Montrose, and we're then going through Lincoln Park. And that was, that was really kind of interesting that, you know, the animals found a new way of, you know, getting down to the lake and saying, wow, this is kind of cool. I don't have to worry about Sheridan Road. I can just walk along the beach. And just within the last couple of days, and I kind of predicted this in my own mind, that I'm sure that we're going to probably break the all-time record for the month of May. And it was just posted by the National Weather Service up in Milwaukee that Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, is now at the all-time record level for the month of May, uh, about two to three inches, I think, above the record, which was 581 feet. It's now 581.5, hey, which would be 581.6. Okay, if you can hang on for yeah, two yeah. seconds, Randall, please turn Rick up a little bit. People are saying they're having problems hearing him. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, so you know, and I, and I'll, and I'll... no, 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 no. We're good. We're just we just got rolling here, and and uh, but I just want to clarify for people listening uh, who d haven't seen the photographs um, and might be listening in other parts of the country. You should know that. Rick DeMaio, our meteorologist, used to live uh, right on the shore of Lake Michigan in the city of Chicago, and he showed us a photo from 2012, and then a photo, when was the other one taken? Just now? Recently? Friday. Okay. Friday. And, and in the photo from... Yeah, and you can see in the earlier photo in 2012 that there's beach and you can walk along yeah. uh, the lake, and now it's swallowed up. That is not there anymore, and it's something that we talked a little bit about last week about the, the lake levels rising because we had a, a couple of guys on here that you would have appreciated. Uh, they are – one was a, um, a, a landscaper, and the other was a construction guy, and these are people trying to save homes from falling into the lake. <laughs> right. Um, right. and they, they put, they put plants in there and they put rocks in there and you've seen it over the years, uh, the, the oh, way yeah. you, mm -hmm. so, uh, that and is also, um, years ago, put the parking 
it's below the level of the ground, and both of those mm. parking lots were filled up with almost four feet of water because of the not only I don't know if the water was coming up through the the drain system, but it was definitely breaching the lake wall and then pouring down into the driveway. Now, someone said to me in the picture that I took that shows the lake basically at record lows, why didn't you take the same picture to compare to how high it is? Well, if I would, the lake water would probably be up above my chest because it's literally Mike and Peg risen. And you can probably, you know, kind of finagle it a little bit, but that change in water is, is almost three and a half feet, which is yeah. amazing that that lake could rise that much. And, and that's just that spot. Think about yeah. how big Lake Michigan is and think how much water that we've had over the last year and a half that has just not gone away. And it's only going to get worse because it doesn't look like this wet pattern that we're in right now is going to go away anytime soon either. Yeah, there's areas of the Leelanau Peninsula up in Michigan, um, fishing villages, quaint little kind of touristy spots that yeah. were underwater last year. They've, they're probably even more inundated by now. Yeah, and, and the problem actually gets worse, Peg, on the other side of the lake where you have yeah. much more in the way of beach erosion due to the fact that you have strong northwest winds. Not only do you have beaches eroding, but you have roads eroding as well, particularly around uh, Union Pier, New Buffalo. So, you know, as much as people are trying to get back to normal, boy, there's a lot of things natural and non unnatural that are keeping us from doing that so far this summer. Yeah, and that gets us back to the the amazing month of May that we had. Right. We had we had skied on from Bartlett Tree Experts uh, earlier. And some folks may have already forgotten that on Mother's Day, we had a hard freeze in this area and yeah. in certain Wisconsin and Indiana and Michigan. I mean, oh God, yeah. matter of fact, and, they, had, they had two up there, Mike. They had two hard freezes in, in the state of Wisconsin. Yeah. And it probably lost uh, uh, some fruit trees, uh, at least the production mm -hmm. uh, of them this year. Uh, and yet three weeks later, here we are uh, setting records for rain. Uh, so this is a May that a lot of people are not going to forget. Yeah, and, and we got we got to be careful about saying that because we had record rain in Chicago, that it was wet everywhere. Because if you look at the month of May for Rockford, Rockford had half the rain that, that O'Hare had. So, and I, and I mentioned this in my briefing last week when I sent some maps out. The heaviest rain literally it was from like southeast Wisconsin, northeast Illinois, literally right down, if you want to call it the I-55 corridor. But once you went north and west, it drops off pretty dramatically. In fact, last year, when we set the record for the month of May, uh, we had 8.25 inches. Rockford had 8.93. And I distinctly mm -hmm. remember May of 2019, we went through the entire month without a single day over two inches. It was just persistent, light to moderate rain, 20 to 23 days of it. And because we had such a wet April, that's one of the reasons why the farmers had such a terrible time getting their crop in. Now the problem is whether or not the crop will last. And hopefully the evaporation we had yesterday and the evaporation we had today will help out with the soils getting back to somewhat near normal. You know, I was I was looking at those maps you sent me uh, and thinking about that in terms of the larger perspective. And you're right. If you go north and west, so right. Minnesota... Minnesota is actually down a little bit in moisture, uh, yeah. but yeah. if you go but if you go south, uh, Missouri right. Missouri had a lot of the uh, the same kinds of rainfall that we had right. here in the Chicago area. So and Indiana had some of that too. So it's it's kind of widespread. There was a there were a number of areas in the Midwest that had a lot of rain. Yeah. So again, it, you got to be careful. We had record rainfall because the rain gauge at O'Hare seemed to be getting the worst of it. But for the state of Illinois, and those numbers have not come out yet, and they probably won't, and we'll share those with your listeners next week, I'm sure that the Illinois Water Survey uh, will probably post something about how much water actually came down in the month of May. It's going to be surprisingly less than what came down in 2019. But I was just looking at some information from Northern Illinois. Uh, uh, you got you got to hold that, Rick. Hold that thought. We'll be right back with Rick DeMille. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Lockdown living, how long will this last? Lockdown living, happen 
so fast. Stay at home's what I heard on TV. I sucked up on the necessities. Lockdown days are so gone with play, and I miss lockdown life. I'm so bored, I'm so bored, cut my hair a million times. I'm so bored. Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. That is uh, Lockdown Life, a parody of the Grease song uh, by Gina Naomi Baez. Uh, I have no idea where she lives, but uh, she did both of them. She did (laughs) the the guy's uh, role and the girl's role uh, in singing that song. I I always play, I've been playing like for, for. Three months now, Rick, uh, uh, parodies, uh, COVID-19 parodies on the show. Yeah, uh, I, I know, I know. <laughs> Are you sick of them already? Is it time to move on? Um, I already arrived a long time ago, put it that way. <laughs> okay. Of the uh, parodies are just moving on, yeah. Uh, that is meteorologist no, Rick DeMaio. I'm just over all of those, most of those songs. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, what? I said I'm over most of those songs. Put it this way. I start up my Sunday mornings from uh, 7 to 9 listening to Frank Sinatra on WGN. So you're talking to the wrong person about me. Uh, you, that, that radio, those radio call letters do not get mentioned on this radio show. Gargantua. Gargantua radio down the dial. That's what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, and uh, that is meteorologist Rick DeMaio. We're talking about, in this area, some uh, yeah. rather extreme weather. Um, what about this, uh, this cool snap? Is this just a, a, a quick little uh, shot and then we go back to the other pattern? Well, it, it just kind of shows you that when you start into these, you know, surges of 90 degree temperatures and dew points in the low to mid seventies, and then you get these patterns where all of a sudden, you know, you drop down with dew points in the mid forties. Um, I think I saw the lowest temperature this morning was a uh, 43 up in Mundelein. It was a 45 in Barrington, a couple of mid to upper 30s across Wisconsin and up into um, parts of Michigan. What this kind of does, Mike and Peg, is it, it sets up this, this kind of like funnel effect where every time you begin to warm up, if the jet stream coming from the north and west is still fairly strong, you're going to end up with these literally these bursts of what we call mesoscale convective complexes that produce really strong winds extremely heavy rain. Uh, oftentimes we refer to those as derechos. And I remember we had uh, a pattern like that back in, in 85. We had a pattern like that um, in um, the late 90s and another one in 2013. So what it does is you end up with these surges of hot weather, but then when you cool down, it's usually with a tremendous amount of rain, thunderstorms, and then followed by cool weather as well. So The way the pattern looks just over the next two weeks, I mean, we're going to be close to 90 degrees, believe it or not, on Tuesday and Wednesday. And this is, you know, 36 hours after we had a low of 43 in some of our suburbs. And it it just seems that we're going to be in these surges of warmth mixed in with surges of severe weather um, and heavy rain, whereas just to the south and west of us could end up being, you know, pretty warm. I would not be surprised if we begin to – kind of replicate the pattern that we had back in 1983, which was the wettest spring on record for the Chicago area. This spring is going to end up being the second wettest. But in 1983, we had incredible moisture, rainfall that is, through April and May. And then all of a sudden in late June, it just stopped. And we literally went into a heat wave and a drought that lasted almost 10 weeks. And it was the one of the worst droughts ever in the history of the Midwest. And it looks like we're kind of going somewhat in that, that kind of direction. Yeah. And, uh, you mentioned the, the low temperatures I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, to our friends listening at KOTA in rapid city, they were at 50 degrees yesterday. Mm-hmm. So, um, this is, uh, this, it seems like this coolness is sort of widespread across the top of the country. I heard on uh, WRC state college PA, they're going to be very cold mm-hmm. in the next couple of days. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the cold pattern definitely begins, you know, a little bit more widespread into the Northeast as well. Now, what that means from a standpoint of, of crops, this kind of weather right now is absolutely perfect because A, you're sunny, B, you're windy, and then C, you have really low dew points. And those are all the things that you need to evaporate. So I think just before we went to the break, I was checking one of the NIU websites 
and it showed that they actually evaporated about a quarter inch of moisture out of the ground. Now, we probably need at least three or four days of that. Um, we'll probably have today and tomorrow, but by the time we get to Tuesday, we're right back into the hot and humid mm -hmm. weather. It's also interesting to note, Mike and Peg, that looking back in Chicago, this ended up being the 12th wettest month ever with 9.51 wow. inches. We still have a bunch, I know, we still have a bunch of other, you know, months that are well above that with 10, 12, even 14 inches. But what was also interesting was how quickly some of the area river rain gauges just jumped right back up a foot and a half to two feet with only about a, um, a half inch or an inch of rain. So it shows you that the, the floodplain across much of northern and northeast Illinois is still absolutely saturated with a lot of moisture. Uh, very quickly, uh, sure. we're, we're starting the uh, hurricane season. What do we need to know about right. what's going on? In, yeah, I mean, we had a typhoon, a uh, monstrous typhoon hit in Asia, uh, I guess the Indian subcontinent, um, during a pandemic. That's not a good thing. Uh, but what are we looking at no. in terms of our oceans? Yeah, and, and you got to remember, for them, typhoons in the month of, of April and May is common. They actually have two seasons out there. Their season goes April through the end of May, and then October through almost the middle of December. The typhoon season in the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, basically shuts down in the summertime due to the monsoon. So once the monsoon begins to pull in all those you know, strong northeast and southeast winds, you have too much low-level shear. So during our hurricane season, um, tropical cyclones, which is what they're named in those areas, typhoons is east of the Malaysian Peninsula, you basically go quiet in that area. Now, when you look at what happened over this past week, we had tropical storm Bertha literally come out of nowhere, formed right off the east coast of South Carolina, went into North Carolina. That's only the second time in the last 50 years that we've had two tropical cyclones in the month of May. And as I wow. talked about this before, when you get into tropical cyclones forming that early, what it does is it blocks the weather patterns coming from west to east, and whatever rains that we have here in the Midwest basically stay here twice as long. It also shows you that the ocean temperatures are still way above normal, although if you look at the entire basin, there's still some areas that are somewhat near normal. So even though we're expecting, and I know the official forecast was for 13 to 19 storms, there's still a lot more that goes into where they develop, how they're going to move, how intense they're going to be, and how much rainfall they're going to get. What All we right. have seen over the last 20 years is that storms just seem to get more intense much more quickly. All right, give us a 10-second forecast here. All right, so beautiful today, 60 lakefront, 70 inland, 75 tomorrow, 85 to 90 for Tuesday and Wednesday with strong thunderstorms, and then near normal temperatures again next weekend, Mike and Peg. All right. Thanks a lot, Rick. We'll talk to you next week. I want to thank all of our guests on the show, and especially Randall. Until next time, go green or go home. Well, you didn't miss much.